So hi everyone, uh, my name is Gabor, Gabor Martin, uh, and I'm really happy that I can talk to you about some galactic science. Because uh, yeah, most of the talks I think it was like software engineering and uh, extragalactic science. Uh, but uh, I'm going to talk about YSOs, uh, Young Stellar Objects, uh, that we try to identify in the Gaia DR2 and also in the photometric science alert system. Uh, I don't know whoever made the choice to give me the chance to talk about this. It was a brave decision uh, because uh, I'm coming from the Konkoli Observatory, which is in Budapest, Hungary. It's a beautiful place, but we don't have any computational science department or big data group or any of this. So I'm basically a complete beginner in this field. So if I say something stupid, you have to excuse me. Uh, so let's start with uh, this small introduction. Uh, why uh, I'm talking about YSOs and what we should know about YSOs. Of course, the star birth is always uh, accompanied by the formation of a circumstellar disk, which is important because it modifies the light emitted by the stars, the young stars. Uh, and it's also heated, so uh, it has its own radi radiation, uh, which is uh, mostly in the infrared uh, near and far. So YSOs can be recognized by the infrared excess. Uh, YSOs, of course, are not stationary objects. Uh, there are many dynamical processes going on. So uh, they sometimes produce light variations or brightness variations. Uh, which are important because they provide information on transitions between the protostellar evolutionary stages. Uh, they provide information on the structure of these disks uh, and different ways how the protostars affect the initial conditions of planet formation because, of course, it's always an interesting question next to uh, star formation. How do the planets form the planetary systems and so on. Uh, and how Gaia comes into the picture is uh, that, of course, Gaia is an all-sky survey, uh, observes the entire sky, and as we already heard, uh, the catalogs include more than one and a half billion objects. And, uh, of course, as it scans the sky, uh, it goes back to a source uh, from time to time, so it is able to see variations in the brightness. This is a, a light curve, often an uh, alert that was published recently. And of course, from these alerts, uh, they have hundreds to 10,000 per day. And there is, of course, a pipeline which goes through all these data and decides which can become uh, alert candidates and some additional filtering and eyeballing uh, is necessary before the uh, alert is published. So there is the VET neural network that which decides which is a uh, uh, interesting enough to be published. So as of Monday, uh, almost uh, uh, 5,800 alerts were published. And uh, as far as we know, only 69 of them are known to be YSOs, which is quite a, lot of, uh, quite a small number. We, we expect a, a higher number, at least around 100 YSO event a year. So we need to capture all these, these uh, sudden brightness changes in YSO to cover all the stages of the star and planet formation. So uh, yeah, we need, need more known YSOs. And there are two ways, as we see, of developing this uh, algorithm. Uh, the first one is that we make it more sensitive to the YSO events. Uh, whatever it means. Of course, uh, YSOs can produce not just dimmings, but brightenings, uh, brightenings and so on. Uh, they are very difficult beasts. And uh, the other way is that uh, we may have already alerted for a YSO, but we don't know that it is a YSO. So we uh, somehow have to figure it out uh, if it was some young star. Uh, but of course, where are the YSOs? I mean, there are many catalogs of, of quasars, AGNs, and uh, many, many thousand, uh, sometimes 100,000 sources are included in these catalogs. But uh, if we want to look for, let's say, YSOs that were confirmed uh, with spectroscopy, we can find only a few thousand. 
And uh, there are these uh, huge data sets from Tumas, WISE and Gaia, which are all sky. Of course, we have Spitzer and Herschel in the infrared, which uh, made targeted observations, but still hundreds of millions of sources we have in those. And even in, in recent papers, the YSOs are identified on, on color, color diagrams like this. You draw straight lines, you draw boxes, which I think is not the most efficient way to identify the, the YSOs or any type of sources, because of course there could be huge overlaps, and this is just one representation of uh, the data cube. There were some more sophisticated uh, methods and attempts by me and my colleagues. Uh, first, we started with Akari data and, and uh, LDA and uh, the QDA, and that's the point where I first started into looking at in, uh, data science, let's say, and uh, then I found uh, papers where they were using uh, SVMs to identify extragalactic objects, and yeah, I was like, okay, let's try it for, for uh, galactic science. Uh, yeah, it is just a map showing that where are those YSOs on the, on the sky which were uh, optically uh, identified and the Spitzer YSOs are overlapped with, uh, with the blue uh, dots. So in this study, uh, we used mostly uh, the Gaia data, uh, the DR2, uh, which uh, by some people uh, was cross match with, with the old ones in a very uh, fashionable way. So we, we trust it. And they ended up with like 300 million sources. Uh, of course, to the old ones, uh, there is some too much uh, photometric data attached. And uh, this can give you like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, eight bands. Uh, where you have photometric data. These are plotted here. So now you have the idea that in the very beginning for class 1 YSOs, you really see at uh, the uh, long wave lines that there is some infrared access which shrinks as the uh, star evolves on the main sequence. When we have just the debris disk and the, the planets, this infrared access is very small. Uh, also, we know that the YSOs are mostly located in, in dusty environments, of course, in, in uh, interstellar clouds. So for uh, the classification, we use the R2.1 uh, Planck dust opacity map, which gives an idea uh, of the environment where these uh, uh, objects are located. So our initial data set where we try to find the YSOs is uh, of uh, 103.5 million sources. Well, of course, we removed those uh, objects where uh, one or more photometric uh, data was missing or which were located in, in regions with low dust opacity values, which means that uh, we, of course, had a look at the known YSOs, where they are located, and the bottom 1% uh, percent, uh, gave us uh, a contour, and inside this contour we, we were looking for for the YSOs. Uh, yeah, so this is a typical classification problem. We, we used uh, and tried uh, several supervised algorithms. Uh, and of course, your classification can be as good as your training sample is. Uh, and there are a very high number of object types. Uh, if you go to, to Simbad, uh, the service of CDS, they list like more than 100 object types, which is not the best way to use in, in such a, a classification. So we bind basically the object types into four big groups, main sequence stars, the extragalactic objects, the evolved stars, and the YSOs. And you see that for the YSOs, we went through actually uh, 78 catalogs, which is very hard to do, according to the colleagues who actually did it. So that's uh, just a representation of, of the, the data cube uh, that we, have, uh, we had. You see with uh, red uh, dots the evolved stars, uh, with blue dots the extralactic sources, uh, with uh, these gray dots you see the main sequence stars. And then the YSOs are hiding somewhere here with green, green dots. So after we uh, collected these objects that uh, serve as the 
uh, training sample, of course, we had to match it to, to the Gaia and all Y sources that we made uh, just simply by using uh, uh, one arc second radius and the closest neighbor uh, was uh, labeled. So in these four big groups, uh, we found uh, as many uh, objects as it's listed here. So you see that for the YSOs, we found only uh, like 14,302 objects. So to avoid a bias by the number of uh, objects in each uh, training sample, we chose 14,000 objects uh, from each. And uh, uh, these were selected randomly. 7,000 to train and 7,000 to validate, so uh, half of them was used to train. Uh, and this process was repeated 10 times. So for each, uh, each time we made a classification, it was uh, like a probability-based classification. For each object, we had a, a probability, uh, what, what is the chance that it is a YSO, let's say. And by doing this 10 times, of course, we, we could uh, assign some errors. So the methods that we used are, are listed here. As I said, I'm, I'm using these as tools. I, I am not, not a developer. I, I'm not able yet to dig into the very deep of these codes and, and make the necessary modifications. But uh, yeah, these were SVMs, we, the four different kernels, uh, random forests with different numbers of trees, k-nearest neighbors, naive base, and uh, neural networks. All of these I use in, in R, so I use the R implementations and the uh, libraries that are publicly available. And this is the, basically the features that uh, we uh, created, all kinds of uh, brightness values and colors. And of course, uh, there are, these are too, too many parameters, maybe. And of course, many of the algorithms is able to uh, select the most important ones. But uh, we also made uh, an attempt to uh, remove the redundant information. So we created such uh, correlation matrices, and uh, we removed those data points uh, or those colors uh, where the Pearson's correlation is stronger than 0 0.7. So we were able to reduce the feature space. But yeah, I, don't, I have two and a half minutes. The results are here, so I highlighted with these uh, red boxes, which we found to be the, the best one using all the features. Uh, and also SVM, Random Forest, and Neural Networks uh, work really well. And uh, after we uh, tested it on, on the reduced uh, dimensionality feature space, uh, we found also that uh, the results are, are quite similar. And in the end, we uh, chose that the Random Forest is fast enough, it's uh, good enough uh, to use for a classification of the unknowns because the, the completeness is like 92.3% uh, uh, and uh, the, the purity is, is high enough and the contamination is, is quite low. So that's what we used to find the, the YSO candidates. I call them candidates because of course we cannot be 100% uh, sure. And th that's the figure I already showed, how they are in this uh, feature space distributed. And this is uh, how the classified ones uh, are distributed. Of course, that's what we expect, quite similar. Uh, and that's, that's the number I, I, I want to show, that uh, the number of uh, objects which were classified as YSO candidate with a probability higher than 0 0.9 is like uh, 1.1 million. I think it's, it's a reasonable number that uh, we, we could expect from the lifetime of uh, stars and how long this uh, stellar revolution lasts. And this is how they are distributed on the, on the sky. Of course, you can recognize the, the galactic plane. You can recognize uh, the famous uh, star-forming regions as well. So at least uh, it, it looks pretty. Uh, and uh, we cross-matched uh, these uh, identified YSO candidates with the published guy alerts. Uh, only 32 are present in the, this initial sample of uh, 103 million. And uh, from the uh, 32, uh, 28 were classified as YSOs with, with a P greater than 0 0.9. And we also uh, classified 32 other sources as YSO candidates. Only two of them 
were known to be some other kind of, of uh, source, not YSOs, but all the others were unknowns. And uh, yeah, okay, I leave you with the future plans, but the point is that uh, we want to improve the algorithm which uh, finds the <laughs> alerts because there are some alerts uh, where we don't want an alert, but there are some light curves where we want an alert, but the s system didn't uh, publish anything, so we have to improve it. Of course, this is now time domain, not uh, photometry, uh, and that's it. Thank you.